Hello and welcome back to the Start a Glamping Business podcast. We've got another great guest for you today. Uh, coming on today is Evan Gart, of, uh, who is the Executive Vice President of Gart Properties. Uh, they're a real estate investment company. Uh, and I first came across Evan uh, on an old recording of the American Glamping Association uh, member meetups, which I recommend everyone uh, becomes a member of, by the way. There's some great content on there. Uh, and Evan was talking about um, a ski resort that, that his, his, his business, had invested in and become owners of uh, and they added some kind of tiny homes to uh, the resort and it, and it you know had a transformative a transformative effect on the bottom line uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today but first of all thank you Evan for coming on uh, I'd love to just give you the floor to introduce yourself introduce Gart Properties uh, and yeah just give us a bit of background on, on um, how everything started. Great thank you Nick and thanks for having me on. Um, yes, so Evan Gart with Gart Properties. We are almost a hundred year old family business now that started um, originally as a little pawn shop in downtown Denver, Colorado, here in the Rocky Mountain West, and grew into a large sporting goods chain. Um, I grew up in the family business in our retail stores, primarily renting skis and selling uh, people golf equipment. Um, and then went to school, came back, joined our real estate investment company, and now run the day-to-day. Uh, and then our, we have another division that is a private equity investment arm that owns and operates uh, operating businesses somewhat similar to our sporting goods chain back in the day. Um, and so that was really the impetus for our acquisition of Powderhorn, not really from a real estate perspective, but obviously a big aspect of most ski resort investments is real estate. And so we have quite a bit of um, working on the, in the two divisions together with the private equity division and the real estate investment company. And before we, we go into the background of the acquisition of, of Powderhorn and what, what you added to it, um, just tell us a little bit about what's there now. Um, so tell us what, what's available at Powderhorn Mountain Resort uh, and, and the kind of units that you've got there uh, and, and, and what people can do there, essentially. Sure. So um, Colorado is certainly one of the more famous uh, states within uh, the U.S. as far as skiing goes. We have, you know, over... Um, certainly over 40 or so resorts. We are the furthest resort to the west. So um, Denver, Colorado is on the front range on the east side of the mountains of the Rocky Mountains and then Powderhorn is on the opposite side of the Rocky Mountains near what's called Grand Junction. Um, We're right next to Palisade. The Grand Junction region's most well known really for uh, we have a bunch of vineyards there. We sell Palisade peaches, which people from all over the U.S. have probably heard of, and uh, mountain biking as well. Um, it's, it's very similar to Moab. A lot of people who go ride at Moab will ride in Grand Junction as well. Uh, the ski area itself is about 1,600 acres. So those familiar with the Colorado market, it's about the size of Crested Butte. Um, which is surprising to most. Honestly, most people in Colorado may have heard of Powderhorn. Um, If you're from Denver, you need to pass 30 other resorts to get there, so they don't often get over there. Um, But really recommend it. It's a phenomenal ski area. One unusual thing of the resort is that there's really only aspen uh, trees, and so that makes for phenomenal glade skiing and great powder days. Um, We're a little unlike the other big resorts where you can come here, you know, three days after a big storm and still have powder. Uh, So it's a bit of a diamond in the rough. Um, We, when we acquired the resort back in 2013, we acquired about 900 acres of undeveloped acreage at the base area. We do have a main lodge. We have, um, three lifts, uh, two large lifts, and then one uh, beginner lift that only goes about a quarter of the way up the mountain. And uh, really the services and amenities when we first acquired it were somewhat limited. At the time we had a small lodge that actually we had chosen not to acquire as a part of the acquisition um, that had about 25 rooms. 
and the owners who ultimately bought it at the auction at the same time that we acquired the resort decided not to put a bunch of money into it. And so unfortunately the product itself wasn't very desirable, uh, which was really the impetus for us to invest in lodging ourselves. And tell us a little bit about the, the lodging you've added, the, these tiny homes. Uh, we'll, we'll put a link in the description so people can take a look for, at what they look like themselves. But um, sure. for those who, who you know don't have time or don't want to click the link, what, what kind of units are they? What do they look like and what's available inside them? Sure. So they are your typical, well, I wouldn't say typical. I mean, they're, they're certainly by all definitions, tiny homes on wheels. They're skirted. So um, unless you were none the wiser, you'd think they're just small mountain cabins on foundations um, they're in a in a the shape of a horseshoe so that we could put fire pits and adirondack chairs and grills and you know under the bistro lights to really have a fun activation and outdoor experience honestly even in the winter but certainly in the summer um, we decided that we wanted a broad range of manufacturers really because I wanted people to stay in one unit one night and look across the way and say, hey, that's kind of a fun unit. I'd love to stay in that next time, or maybe I'll stay in that uh, tomorrow night if, if there were availability, um, which has proven to be uh, certainly the case. Um, anywhere between 250 to 399 square feet and everything from more of the Scandinavian modern feel to more of the traditional mountain alpine feel. Um, but we do have, right now we only have six units, um, but they're all different, none are the same. And, and that that's only a positive in my opinion. I think when you go to a lot of resorts and you have the cookie cutters, uh, it comes across as um, a bit bland and not unique and individualized. And so it was important to us that it, it felt um, high quality and, and differentiated. Yeah, and that's one thing we've always said um, to, to any prospective glamping operator is at least try and have some kind of variation in the units that you offer just because, you know, if someone stays one year, uh, they look around and they see the other units on site, they're probably gonna wanna come back and, and try them uh, and try the different experience. So it absolutely makes sense to do that. And, and I'm sure right. it helps your, your repeat bookings as well. Um, yeah. So what, what drove the decision to, to put these tiny homes onto the property? Um, well, first of all, you, you bought the, the resort in 2013, right? Uh, yeah. And when, when did you decide to, to put these units on and, and why did you decide to do it? Sure. So we bought the resort out of bankruptcy um, in 2013. Those who know the ski business know that I'm not aware of a single resort that has not gone through bankruptcy. It's a very, it's a capital intensive business. Um, and then some, I mean, just to give you some insight, uh, a new chairlift, new high speed quad, which these days is really a requirement is north of $6 million or, or greater. Um, all ski resorts just as an insurance policy need to put in top to bottom snowmaking. Um, so it's just really capital intensive. So that, that has, um, really made most resorts, even the big boys like Vale Associates, um, go under at some point, unfortunately. And so that presented an opportunity for us. Uh, funny enough, crazy enough, it was literally a live auction in the lodge of the resort with paddles, and they're selling a ski resort, and they're selling all the various assets um, independently or together. Like I said, we had decided to buy the primary ski area amenities, which was the lodge and a few other small base area administrative buildings, um, you know, warehouses to store the, the snow cats, things like that. Um, there were, as I mentioned, a 25 unit uh, hotel right at the base area as well. And then um, the eight or 900 or so undeveloped acres uh, right at the base area. And that was, I mean, in some sense, it's a liability because that's that's a, a huge blank slate and that's really a, an enormous project to tackle. But it's really unusual and honestly unheard of, certainly in Colorado, if not 
all of the U.S. to have a, a essentially completely undeveloped ski resort. Um, and, and really most ski resorts, significant um, opportunity for long-term value is, is real estate investment. And so um, that was certainly interesting to us. Uh, we came in, uh, stabilized the operations of the resort, started to invest in the resort. We replaced what are called, uh, the primary lift was a fixed grip. So if you've been at ski resorts, you've been on those super old lifts where the chairlift swings around and kind of kicks you in the butt. It's uncomfortable and it's a 30 minute ride, 25 minute ride up the mountain. Um, in order to have downhill mountain biking, you need to have what's called a detachable lift, a modern, um, you know, high speed quad is what they call them. So that the lift, when it comes into the terminal, slows down, you can put the uh, bike on the back of it and it'll bring it up to the top. So we bought a brand new, uh, what we called the flat top flyer, uh, for, uh, I want to say it's a seven or eight minute ride from bottom to top, um, which was a phenomenal investment. We are we have the long term goal of having about 12 miles of single track downhill mountain biking trails. We're about halfway there right now before it had none. And honestly, we had no summer business. Uh, we had a few few weddings here and there. And um, now we have uh, a really robust, great uh, summer business. As far as the tiny homes go, we looked at the land and thought to ourselves, you know, this is a little unusual. Usually the land value at the resorts is too high to make sense of low density development. Um, you need to go vertical and there isn't the demand for that here. Um, we just were a, a small regional resort. And so the idea was, what can we do that no other resort could really make sense of and have that be an asset for us? And so we ultimately came up with alternative lodging more as, as just a general concept. Um, the What made tiny homes interesting and attractive is right now, you know, with the 900 or so acres, some of that is more desirable than others. We can add significant value to the, both the ski resort and the real estate with tiny homes. And long-term, we can just move those tiny homes a little bit further away from the resort and now have, maybe we will have demand for a multi-story hotel. And so the flexibility of those tiny homes is very attractive to us, but also you know, there was a time where I, I was wondering or concerned, is this, is this a fad? And I don't believe it is. I have brought my friends and family up to Powderhorn consistently and everyone just absolutely loves it and wants to come back. And uh, Powderhorn was, again, a somewhat unknown ski area here in Colorado. You'd ask people in Denver and they'd maybe hear about it. And there have been instances where they say, is that the place with the, the tiny homes at the base? I've heard great things. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of an unusual fun amenity. Really the vision though, we need a bunch of units. And so what we had done three or four years ago was just bought three tiny homes and put them at the base area without people staying in them. But we had college kids come in and just give people tours. And so they're about 50 feet away from our main high speed lift right at the base area. You'd finish up skiing, go to the bar, you'd walk by the, the tiny home, you'd check it out. Um, and we just had a list of uh, people who were interested in, in staying the night and just wanted to gauge if there was any interest. We didn't want to put out all the capital to buy additional units and to, uh, to do the land improvements unless there's some significant demand. And, and very quickly, it was obvious that there was. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a former ice rink right below the main high-speed quad, already graded. There is actually some other commercial and residential uh, properties around it. So most of the infrastructure was at, at least nearby. 
Um, and it was just a natural place to put in this initial phase, which again, uh, was just more of a proof of concept. Um, six units isn't really enough to significantly move the needle at the resort, just given our size. But again, is there interest for this? Would people buy units long-term? Um, and so we put in these six units with four different manufacturers, again, in this, um, kind of horseshoe shape right next to the high speed quad. It is essentially ski in, ski out. Um, you can look out the window of most of the units and see the, the chairlift in the lodge, which is fun. And um, it has really been a, a big hit and a home run. And so long term, or hopefully really not long term, I mean, we're working through approvals right now. We would like to build an alternative lodging development at the base area with 60 plus tiny homes or mountain cabins and RV slots, uh, basic primitive camping slots, van spots, um, probably some teepees, you know, for summer use and then yurts for year round. Mm -hmm. Again, with the idea of people coming and staying in a tiny home and, and seeing a different unit and wanting to, wanting to stay there. Uh, we've, you know, there's obviously so many different opportunities to kind of cross market between the ski operations or summer operations and the resort uh, and the hotel operation itself. So one concept is maybe you, uh, you do a, a skinning or a mini hut trip where you can um, skin around, ski around our wilderness area at the base area and finish up at one of the yurts and stay overnight. Um, the As far as the, the business plan itself, our intention is actually to sell the tiny homes. Um, the individual unit owner would put it on one of our pieces of land and then put it into a rental program. So that way um, the individual owner can you know, own a $100,000 ski home, which is, you know, you, you cannot find when you look at the cheapest full ownership unit or home in the state at a ski area, you can't find anything for, you know, maybe you can find an $800,000 condo at one of the smaller, uh, more affordable ski resorts. And so you can buy fractional shares or say a quarter share for $250,000. But what we can offer you is a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand dollar really cool, fun, unusual mountain house um, at a great ski resort. And not only that, by putting it into our rental program, we will operate as a hotel. Someone would come stay in a tiny house; they'd be none the wiser that it was owned by Nick, for example. Um, and they could offset their ownership costs and perhaps as uh, make a profit as well. Hi everyone, thanks for listening. This is just a quick note to say that this podcast is brought to you by Glamper Techs in North America. And what we do is we help you through the process of starting a glamping business no matter what stage you're at. So if you need to find a property, we'll tell you where the most suitable area is to start your glamping business. If you have a property, we'll look at your local zoning code and tell you how likely you are to get your project off the ground according to the zoning rules and regulations in your local area. We'll also give you a really good roadmap of permits that you'll need and regulations that you'll need to be aware of to get your glamping business off the ground. If you need financing, we'll introduce you to our range of financing partners and do you a feasibility study that will give you some really solid financial projections and market analysis that will allow you to acquire the funding that you need. If you need glamping units, we'll talk you through your options and introduce you to one of our trusted manufacturing partners to ensure that you're looked after throughout the whole process. If you need a site design or if you need permits to move forward with your project, we've got architects who will do all your drawings, make all your arguments and essentially allow your dream to become a reality. The list goes on and I don't want to bore you, so I'll let you get back to the episode in a second. All I'd say is that Glamper Techs North America are the people to speak to about starting a glamping business in the US or Canada. So if you're even thinking of starting a glamping business, just get in touch with us at contact at 
or 646 586 2330. All the details are in the description and no matter what stage of the process you're at, we will be able to help, whether it's doing something ourselves or pointing you in the right direction of our partners. Just let us know that you came from the podcast and we'll see about doing you a little discount along the way. So thanks for listening and I'll let you get back to the episode. The one thing I do just want to pick you up on what you said is is really you've kind of stumbled across the a development strategy that I think is is really uh, not being recognised yet by real estate uh, developers. Um, you know, I, I, I'm from the glamping industry. You know, I've been aware of this for a number of years now uh, and it's kind of developed organically. But it, it, I still don't think, for example, there's lots of short term rental investors who buy uh, traditional homes, put them on Airbnb and make good money from that. You know, you can really scale it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I really don't think many people are aware of just how good the returns can be uh, on, you know, what I would call glamping. You you probably call it something else, but but these individual units where you don't have to subdivide them, you don't have to worry about all of that. You can just put them on your land, get the permits, and then rent them out for, uh, you know, hundreds of dollars per night. And I really don't think, uh, you know, you, you're 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 one of the. I genuinely think you're one of the early, the earliest sort of real estate development companies that have sort of cottoned onto this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it'll be a matter of time before they do. Uh, you know, no one, no one in the STR world really is talking about glamping. But I think the returns are so astronomical. You know, you're seeing your money returned in two years in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereas traditional short-term rental investing, you look in five, 10, 15 years. So um, I do just want to pick you up on that, particularly if there's any short-term rental or, or even long-term rental investors listening, is that this is a kind of uncharted territory almost. It's, it's, it really is like the early days, I think. Um, and I think it, it's only going to be so long before um, sort of institutional capital, traditional real estate investment companies really realise just how how good the market is because obviously you've you've got experience developing real estate right and have you seen many instances where the returns can be as good as as you found on on these you know small units on on one sort of plot of land yeah i mean there's it's uh it's certainly a good business and um more people get into it maybe the worse it'll get but well, maybe. Right, right now it's uh it's still a a, a, a great great business for sure yeah and, and that's where it all comes down to being unique as well because obviously you know people will realize at some point and start to put money into it and that's where obviously you've got to you've got to stand out from the crowd um i know yeah. for, for example coming from the uk glamping industry um that's that's you know a lot more sort of cook, cook, cookie cutter now really um mm-hmm. compared to the us which is you have the there's more money going around in the us in terms of putting money into the likes of auto camp under canvas etc but uh, there's a lot more variety sure. uh, and and we're a million miles from saturation so uh, it would be interesting to see see how things go in and how long it takes for for real estate companies to sort of really cotton on to, to how good of a business this can be um and so so on, on the topic of you know the business case for something like this um, yeah, you know, how much did this this initial trial period cost in terms of you know how much the unit costs and permits and everything like that, and then how much yeah. are you able to charge per night for each of these units? Sure. So, cost wise, the individual units were anywhere between our smallest unit, which is more of a st- studio model. It's actually my favorite unit. It was about forty five thousand, um, all the way up to ninety thousand. This was pre COVID, so. I have not looked back and I'm sure it would be significantly more expensive today. Um, we had 300 or so thousand dollars in uh, site improvements for that initial parcel. And then um, obviously the scale is much bigger on our long, broader project where we'll have significant infrastructure and roads that we actually need to put in. And so that's going to be a, a whole nother level. Um, but to the extent that pe- people have existing flat areas with infrastructure close by, um, you can do it somewhat affordably and it's still a decent investment. Um, rates, it's of course just dep- it's very reasonable, regional and, and depends on where you're located. Um, Powderhorn still is very much a, a, a accessible and affordable resort and so we we need to price it accordingly um and it's seasonal so we have shoulder seasons where we have close to no occupancy where say our smallest unit would rent for 
as low as 50 or 60 bucks a night. And then for our biggest 400 square foot unit, you know, around the holidays, around Christmas, that will be 500 bucks a night. Um, so a pretty broad range. Um, and obviously, you know, actually it's been great. Summer business at ski resorts wasn't really much of a thing until about 10 years ago. And the big resorts did a great job of adding amenities and, and uh, you know, summer bike parks. And so we have done the same thing more recently there. Um, and you know now we can get certainly not as uh, not as high of rates as the winter, but I'd say seventy five percent of the winter rates, which is phenomenal, and that was not the case in the past. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that there was a a lodge that had been on, on site for I don't know how many years uh, before you bought the the resort. How have these units performed compared to that twenty five room lodge? Sure. Yeah, 25 rooms is probably built in the 80s. Um, our first year, so six units in our t uh, phase one tiny home project, uh, we had more room nights in that first year from our six units than our best year ever from the 25 unit hotel. <laughs> so it was pretty uh, obvious that there was demand for a well-kept, unusual uh, lodging experience. That that's really the only data that we had to look at. And um, what what kind of effect has this had on on the ski resorts bottom line in general? Ski resorts need beds for people to uh, you know stay multiple days at a, a ski resort. We look at what we call skier days, um, and so it's so if you have a, a thousand tickets swiped or passes swiped in a day that's a thousand skier days um, and every incremental skier day once you cover your fixed cost is an incremental profit to the bottom line and so when you have lodging it means that that skier day which may have been a, a day skier is now going to stay two three four days and so it definitely had a meaningful effect on getting families up there for longer than just a day trip um, and so it's, it's, it's been phenomenal. I wouldn't say it's transformational for the ski operations itself, because again, it's only six units. Um, but we believe and we're confident in our long-term plan, as I said, to build the 60 units, then another hundred, um, alternative lodging sites that will really be transformational for the ski resort. Well, we'll have to check in in a couple of years time and see how it's gone. Uh, yeah. why, why do you think they're so popular? I think it comes down to, you know, alternative lodging is popular at just a pretty piece of land anywhere, right? And so when you add it next to an, a, a great outdoor amenity, like a bike park or a ski area, it's that more unusual. Um, like I said, there's just so many barriers to entry for any sort of development at any ski resort. And so the, the mere fact that we were able to do this at the ski resort and within 50 feet of the main lift is very unusual. Uh, and so people just love it. And you mentioned earlier, you're, you're doing a program whereby people can, can buy one of the homes and um, you can look after it for, for a management fee. Yeah, uh, and and you know you can split some of the revenue from renting it out. Um, what that that's going to be quite unusual for most of this, the people listening to this because most people you know glamping it's just you know the owner owns the owns the the, camp, the, the glamp ground including the units and they will just rent them out uh, for you know let's say two hundred three hundred dollars per night and and that's it that's the only sort of ownership structure. What you're doing is is a bit more unusual. Yeah. Um, so where did that idea come about and, and um, you know, how's that gone for you so far? Yeah, so that model, it's certainly, I don't know if it actually came from the ski business, but it's very common in the ski business for just what they call condo hotels. So um, there are hotels certainly all over the United States at ski areas even the the big flags that you would know of say a you know marriott or a weston you'll go and you'll book a room you'll be staying in that room and and again you'd be none the wiser that it was in fact owned by an individual investor it's a very common 
um, business plan for more traditional uh, hotel units at ski areas, again, what they call a condo hotel. And so that business model translate translated into this glamping model. Um, it's a benefit to us and the owners in several ways for us. It's that much less capital outlay that we have initially. So if we buy you know, 60 units at $100,000 a pop, now we have you buy it and so we save um, all of that initial investment and just have the initial investment in the infrastructure. Um, and then really it comes down to control. I want, I don't want a trailer park. And so if I leave, if I have 60 units you're going to end up selling to someone who probably won't keep it very nice or might not buy the unit that really fits into the vibe and the feel that we're going for. It's important that you drive in. It's the same thing as a hotel. You want the furniture to be similar, the aesthetic to be similar. You want that control to know that, oh, I'm, I'm staying at X so-and-so hotel um, and it feels good. Um, so it ensures that, that it feels good and feels the same, that's high quality. Um, and at the end of the day, it's great for the unit owner because they're not having to deal with the nightly rentals and we do that for them. Um, and so with, with the expansion that you're planning, are you looking to presumably do the same uh, model uh, and, and are people able to, to sort of express their interest in buying these units already? Yes, yeah, you can go to our website and uh, submit your information. Um, we would love to sell you a unit. Um, well, essentially it'll be like buying a car. So we'll say have between four and six models that you can choose from. You can choose various trims and finishes with the unit. And again, put it into our rental program and, and onto our property. Um, hopefully we'll start being able to sell those um, and even staying in those about a year, year and a half from now. Fantastic. So, so um, thank you, Evan. Loads of great information there. Particularly, I know we'll probably have a couple of ski resort owners listening to this as well. Hopefully, not in uh, Colorado, so we're not helping your competition. But um, we, uh, if anyone wants to sort of get in touch and ask you any questions, maybe express some interest in in um, in, in buying some of the units or helping with the development. Um, what's the best way to reach you? Sure, you can just email me uh, egart at gartproperties.com. Fantastic. Well, hopefully some people do that. Hopefully we, we can encourage a few people to um, spend some money at your ski resort as well. So um, thank you again, Evan. I'm sure we'll be catching up in, in, in a couple of years to see how the, the, the expansion's gone. And, and yeah, we'll speak to you soon. Thanks so much, Nick. Thanks for having me on.